Welcome. My name is Lydia XC Brown, pronouns they, them. I am the Autistic Woman and Nonbinary Network's Director of Policy, Advocacy, and External Affairs. I'm a youngish East Asian person with short black hair and glasses, wearing a t-shirt with the radical symbol. It says radical public health, probe, provoke, praxis, in a room with two windows with blinds behind me. I am so excited to welcome you to the next program in our liberating webinar series. Tonight, we'll be discussing health justice and disability justice, disabled perspectives in public health research, policy, and advocacy. I'm so excited to introduce to you two of my friends, comrades, and colleagues who will be joining us for tonight's discussion. First, I'd like to introduce Nasra D. Nicola, Lead Health and Disability Program Coordinator in the Office of Health Equity at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. She's advised numerous programs within DPH and across the country on ways to learn from and include disabled people as both members of the public and colleagues. When not working or when in long meetings, she can be found knitting piles of lace shawls and blankets for other people's babies. And she has knitting with her today. It is gorgeous and I can't wait to see what it turns into. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Emily M. Lund, PhD, CRC, an assistant professor of counselor education in the Department of Educational Studies in Psychology, Research Methodology and Counseling at the University of Alabama. Their primary research interests include interpersonal violence and trauma in people with disabilities, suicide and non-suicidal self-injury in people with disabilities, the experiences of graduate students with disabilities, and LGBTQ issues, particularly as they intersect with disability. Dr. Lund has published over 90 peer-reviewed articles and edited two books on these and similar topics. Their work emphasizes positive disability identity development, marginalization, intersectionality, and disability cultural competence. I am so glad to have both of you here, and especially because, Emily, I feel like I get to brag a little bit. I am one of the people who wrote a chapter in one of those two books mm -hmm. that you helped to edit. And I also enjoy sharing space with you because you and Nasara both have work that has spanned so many different areas and so many different topics and communities and really synthesize them in ways that many people don't. I've shared both of your bios, and I think, you know, a lot of people might find that to be very impressive and perhaps interesting. I want to ask both of you if you could start us off by telling us a little bit about how your work bridges disability justice principles and movement work with public health advocacy. Who do you want to start? I'll start this family one. Um, I'm a white, uh, non binary person with medium brown hair, glasses, and I'm wearing a blue sweater and I'm in a room with white balls. Uh, for me, bridging this religion in public health means that you, you don't view disability as a health problem to be eliminated or controlled, you view it as a mark my community and an aspect of some identity that improves your health, but it not itself negative or pathological. Yeah, um, this is Nasra. Um, I am a I guess I can't really say youngish anymore, um, but uh, fat Arab American femme um, with light skin and very dark brown hair in a braid over my shoulder. Um, I'm wearing red glasses, earrings and lipstick and a gray scoop neck dress um, and sitting in front of uh, a very dramatically lit <laughs> wall um, with a lot of black artwork framed in gold um, because that's the wall that my partner designed and she is a goth for life. Um, and since Lydia mentioned my knitting, it's usually below the screen, but this is 
eventually going to be a like coral blood orange colored um, summer top with a lace collar around it. Um, but mostly is just a stim toy at the moment. Um, so yeah, so I agree with what you were saying, Emily, about viewing people with disabilities as um, well, it, disability in general as a demographic versus an outcome, um, which is sort of the shorthand way that we talk about it um, in our office, at least, um, and and particularly not a failed health, health outcome. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also the the thing that I have been working on since I started thinking of myself as a public health person um, is also recognizing that people with disabilities are not just a population out there, um, but can also be inside the profession of public health. So like, I think every time I've been in a webinar where uh, a group of people who mostly don't do disability talk about disability in public health. Um, I've live tweeted something that Lydia has seen um, about, you know, people with disabilities and public health professionals being treated as two completely separate and non intersecting groups and just losing my cool every time. Um, and so one of the things that I um, have been working on is increasing the sense that like people with disabilities are among us and if there are not enough people with disabilities or disabled people in the public health professions that's not natural that is an outcome of ableism um and that's something we should work on fixing rather than just accepting as nice. a fact um, Basically, Emily, I totally agree with everything you said, and that something that has been a struggle throughout my career in terms of feeling alone and feeling excluded. I felt like people had expect me to choose between, well, are you an academic or a clinician, or are you a disabled person? And I'm like, well, I'm both. <laughs> My disability didn't take away my PD, and my PD didn't take away my disability. And that's something I think had been really difficult for me and other disabled um, people in the field I know. It will always feel like we had to choose whether we want to be seen as a professional or as a disabled person, and that economy did point to so much evil within the field. I remember yeah. when I was in uh, my Ratner program, a professor said to me, we don't know what to do when one of you, meaning what this building, want to become one of us. And that really stuck with me and kind of showed me how much work we had to do in the field in terms of including disabled people. Damn. Points for honesty, I guess. But wow. Um, yeah. God, I don't even know where to go with that. Um, I've had some pretty appalling things said straight to my face, but that might be a new one. Um, yeah, I think one thing, so one of the things I do at my current job is facilitate a statewide health and disability partnership, um, which was established to be like the advisory council for the health and disability program that I run. Um, and historically it's been very much like run and facilitated by the department of public health like we convene it we set the agenda um we do all the background work and plan all the speakers um and it was getting kind of stale and honestly a lot of people who were there were there because they were paid to be um and so it was a lot of even even among the people with disabilities a lot of them were there with their professional hats on um and so one thing we've had to do over the past several years is really intentionally remove control over that group from our own hands and like throw it as far as possible into the community um and it's been rough like convincing people with disabilities outside the public health profession that they have something worth saying and worth listening to without us setting the agenda. Um, I think public health 
I mean, has a long and sordid history with the disability community, mostly trying to eliminate it. Um, and so the idea that we're not just letting disabled people into our space, but providing a physical space, but then asking to be let in um, into disabled space um, and asking to learn and asking to um, to submit ourselves, I guess, to the um, to the opinions and the judgment and the um, community wisdom of the disabled community has been a huge step um, for some of my colleagues. For me, it, it kind of feels normal um, because professional, I mean, A, because this is just what I do in general in my social life, like I hang out with disabled people. It's not that confusing. Um, but also I came up in the independent living movement. So before I was at the Department of Public Health, I worked at the Boston Center for Independent Living. Um, and so um, the idea that the people running things would be disabled people unless there was a very, very good reason not to be um, has been ingrained in me since then. Um, and so bringing that kind of expectation that like if you talk to a colleague or if you talk to someone who knows what they're talking about uh, in the field, the expectation is that they have some lived experience to back that up unless proven otherwise. Um, and I think that that's a paradigm shift for a lot of people. Um, a lot of disabled people, but then a lot of like the rest of the field. <laughs> Ms. Memory, thank you for bringing that up. And what you said about acting to be written to the disabled space and run another way around uh, really struck a hold at me because I do a lot of community based participatory research, CBPR. And one thing I struggle with sometimes when I'm working with calling the art way with CBPR is I have to say, this is an advisory board. You're not acting disabled with your rubber staff, what you're doing. And you just say, look, great, you know, you're such a great academic, go you. You're actually really understanding that they are experts as much as you are, if not more, in this area. Mm -hmm. You need to actually listen to their critical advice and feedback and incorporate it. This is Nasra. Even the idea of coming to people at the beginning of a project rather than the end um, mm -hmm. has been a huge shift. Um, so yeah, not presenting it as a done deal for them to sign off on, um, but actually saying, okay, here's the like vague um, plan that we were thinking about possibly doing. How can we not screw it up at this point? Um, and that's also really vulnerable. Like we're used to being, and when I say we, it can mean any number of a different, uh, any of a number of different groups. Um, so in this case, we public health professionals, like we're used to being on top of things or at least seeming like we're on top of things. We're used to presenting work that has been um, reviewed and revised and, you know, looked over by our peers, approved by our leadership, um, depending if you work in academia or bureaucracy like I do. <laughs> um, so to come in front of a group of people and say, I don't know what I'm doing yet. Um, here are the thoughts that I have that are kind of all over the place. I don't know yet how to make them into a good and useful and coherent whole. And I don't want to make something up without hearing from you first. That is incredibly vulnerable. Um, and I think that being able to get into that space as part of the health and disability partnership actually then serves a lot of my colleagues well when dealing with other communities that they're working with. Like they practiced talking about things that they weren't hundred percent sure of in a space where they got really good feedback. And they're like, oh, okay, I can do this again. Like I can talk to people of color and not know what I'm talking about and see, um, 
what ideas come out of that lack of polish. Like, um, I can talk to youth and get mercilessly roasted for not having my act together. Um, and my act will get more together and I will be much better um, at the end of this. So the I, that vulnerability is, I think, something that disabled people are particularly good at amongst ourselves, not always good at um, with the outside world because we have to be super crip sometimes, mm -hmm. um, but also a really good lesson um, that we have to teach the rest of the profession as like, you're, you're going to be a mess sometimes and that's where the best stuff comes out of. Definitely, definitely. Like, I actually think it really humbling and required humility to come to a group and say, I need you to help me be as it's going to go. I need you to help me make it better. Mm -hmm. And it's important to approach uh, any community group, but particularly my community group, that community, because I think individuals from my group will show up to you to being told that our opinions don't matter, or our experiences don't matter. To put someone in that position of power, it's liberating, but it also sometimes frightening, or they don't know if they can trust you. Yeah, and like they have no reason to. Uh, this is this is not true. Um, one thing I've been talking a lot about, so. I've, because of the unprecedented times that we are in, which is to say the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I've kind of taken on a second job uh, at the Department of Public Health um, doing vaccine education. Um, so I, I work with a team of vaccine ambassadors and I promise this gets back around to the story eventually. Um, I work with a group of uh, COVID-19 vaccine ambassadors who were volunteers throughout the Department of Public Health who will go out into communities and like talk about the vaccine and answer questions and be really honest about what we do and don't know. Um, and the first slide we always use is the like, you probably don't trust us and that's okay and we know it and we know there's a reason for it. <laughs> um, and the people who who wrote that slide originally like automatically said like there's a long history of racism in public health. Um, you know, they were at first referencing Tuskegee and then cut it for length and clarity, but like there were very specific examples that they had in their head about ways in which the public health profession has either failed or maliciously targeted um, communities of color, particularly black communities. Um, and I had to say like, we're in Massachusetts, like we are very proud of ourselves for a lot of things, um, but we are also the state where, um, you know, within living memory, our uh, state institution um, for folks with IDD experimented with radium laced oatmeal. Um, just to see what would happen. Um, and, you know, we we have a very recent history of forced sterilization. Like Massachusetts is not a shining beacon on the hill free of ableism. Um, and the fact that nobody thought to mention ableism as one reason why people might not trust public health, I think is a really good example of the work that we still have to do. Um, so I got that in there. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, it's it's always surprising how people are really good at recognizing um, some aspects of public health's nasty history and then just not noticing the rest of it because either they never learned about it or they hear about it and it sounds normal. Miss Emily, thank you so much for being at the issue that you were in and kind of contact COVID because Carl and I had done some work on that, um, particularly around the concern about healthcare rationing, ventilator rationing, and now that lean access among uh, disabled community. And one thing we brought up repeating about the bit and nothing new, like this is just the more able with them in the long line of able with them in public health and in mm -hmm. healthcare. And the cult disabled people are terrified because they have every reason, every right to be. And yeah. especially disabled people of color who 
they spoke basically with ableism and the intersectionality of that. Mm-hmm. They had no reason to believe they'll be treated adequately or fairly because history had shown that they really won't a lot of times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we think about vaccine hesitance as like this this big looming fear that people have irrationally. And like, you know, it may not be the specific things that people are afraid of with this vaccine may not be factual this time, but the caution is not irrational. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think one of the things that having more disabled people in public health um, can do, if we are careful, is start to build that comfort and trust back up from you know, a very deservedly low point. Um, I say if we're careful, because it's also really easy for those of us who are kind of in that straddling both worlds position um, to sell out or to be perceived as selling out. (laughs) Um, And so at a certain point, like I have to make sure to keep my credibility with the community as well as with my colleagues or I can't get my work done on either side. Mm -hmm. Um, And when you're talking about care rationing, that was one um, time where like I spent a lot of credibility and I wasn't sure I was gonna get it back um, because the first draft of our state's crisis standards of care, um, I will say was a lot better than other states first drafts. Um, like we, we got further on the first draft than most places did, but it still would have left a lot of particularly vent users, um, up a creek. Um, and when it came out, the backlash from the community, like, felt like a personal failing for me. Um, Like I hadn't done enough. I hadn't been in enough rooms. I hadn't gone to enough meetings or shouted loud enough at enough of them um, to protect people. Um, And so like I had to admit, like, here's the limits of of the power that I actually have. Um, Here are the perspectives that I try and bring to the table. Here are the tables I'm not invited to. and there can't just be one loud disabled person in the entire public health infrastructure because we can't attend all the meetings. <laughs> um, and so there, we got more um, community representation on the health equity advisory group. Um, and thanks to, I think you mentioned Colin from uh, the Disability Policy Consortium at the beginning of what you were saying, um, but thanks, thanks to, uh, Colin Killick um, of DPC and a number of other people, like we re- rewrote the standards of care. Um, and I would say they're one of the most equitable for people with disabilities and people of color in the country at this point. And also when vaccine prioritization came around, we had the exact same problem. So like you win, ba- you win one battle, you take a breath, and then all of a sudden you get um, sideswiped by another one. And I think that's a good point because what I often find between the calling is, yeah, the disability community and other modern communities, uh, black indigenous and people of color, yeah, we've been doing a lot of work and we've been making good gain. Like we had all the pushback on the healthcare rationing and got, you know, the pitch response from the Office for Civil Rights saying, hey, you can't ignore the American Disability Act because of the pandemic. But all that acted in technology. It takes a lot of emotional energy, a lot of time, a lot of resources, and it gets tiring. And you, you know, can't really expect one or two people to do it all because not only are they just one or two people, but they also have wives and jobs and family and whatnot outside of this. Well, I guess some people have lives. <laughs> um, no, but also, like, this is an inherently energy sapping enterprise. And you know who doesn't have a lot of energy to begin with? A lot of disabled people. Like, <laughs> Not only are you fighting with your colleagues and with people who you respect professionally for the right to survive and for the right of people like you to survive, um, which is really 
draining. Um, you also need some of that energy to keep surviving for other reasons. Like there was definitely a time during the pandemic where if I wasn't working, I was sleeping and not like not eating, not talking to people, not knitting, which is a danger sign. Um, because it was so exhausting just to stay alive and like yeah I have chronic pain I have chronic fatigue like it is it is very tiring to be me even when there isn't a life and death struggle happening every day um and yeah so it's it's rough to say like this is a case for getting more disabled people in the profession when sometimes that means that there are going to be disabled people chewed up and spit out by the profession mm -hmm. um but the more of us there are the more we can care for each other and support each other um and take turns and like spell each other mm -hmm. um so that more of the work gets done at less of a cost to each of us this room we definitely uh distributed label is i think very really important and I think that will a lot of, um, will, even when they're being well-meaning, will feel, because they're like, oh, we had one disabled person, we had one trans person, we had one black person, we had one person of color. And they end up falling on that person's shoulder to do everything. And mm -hmm. it's exhausting and it's not really st sustainable. So. I definitely agree, and part of the work I do it on education and training in psychology, and particularly disabled trainings. And one thing uh, I hear repeatedly in that work is that people, disabled people in uh, my field and other feel really alone, and really much like they're the only one going through this. And when they can connect with other disabled people and they can see mentors and calling in the field, it makes it much easier to get through all the able them. Yeah. Because they aren't navigating alone. And I think that's critical too. Yeah. Um, one of my closest friends at work, um, I met once in a meeting at some point. Um, and then spontaneously ran into uh, on the T, the subway after that, coming into work one morning. And I mentioned something uh, like I was using a cane at that point, And I mentioned something about, uh, you know, being really glad I'd gotten a seat because otherwise with the shaking, like I would have dislocated something. And she looked at me and she was like, oh, do you have EDS? Um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which would, yes, in fact, I was like, yeah, I, I do. And she was like, oh, me too i was kind of wondering um and we were like friends like that after that moment um you know, for for a rare condition there actually turned out to be a lot of us in the workplace um and so the just the necessity of that um really planted in my head like i wanted to have a group of disabled folks in the workplace who could make those connections with each other. And like, it sounds really like corporate and tacky um, to have like an employee resource group. Um, so we, I just got the sign off um, like this week to start um, a disability working group at work. Um, and part of it is going to be for everybody who's doing disability related stuff in the Department of Public Health to talk to each other and make sure that we all know what's going on and are advising each other. Um, but also for those of us who are disabled public health professionals, um, there's going to be like a spin-off affinity group um, just so we can relax and be in each other's presence. Um, and I am so looking forward to that. I cannot even describe. But describing the need for it to um, to the folks who had to sign off on it. It's like, no, this is not going to be like an HR space where people are requesting accommodations. And like, uh, no, it's not, uh, we're not going to be sharing, you know, personal health information that needs to be signed off on. Like, we're just a group of disabled people getting together and talking about our lives. Like, this is, we're not always a liability issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. And 
this memory, I think that including well said that we're not on the liability issue because uh, one thing I come across repeating my book, thinking my book on training with disabilities is that people are like, well, we have the ADA, so we're good, right? No discrimination. Like, but no, because A, the ADA had a lot of loopholes and gaps in it. And B, you also need to actually advocate your training and be disability culturally competent. Mm-hmm. Understand that you can't just say, oh, that's an ADA thing, go to HR. Right. Then we'll think of it again because that's how you get training with disability who don't feel supported, who drop out or leave when they have no. Like they have the ability to do great things in the field, but you aren't supporting them. Mm-hmm. And it goes beyond to be saying, well, we have the ADA. Yeah. Particularly because, as I like to point out, it's the only civil rights law with an unless it's too tough and cramps your style mm-hmm. clause, um, which is to say the undue burden uh, part of the ADA. And just the fact that I have to stand up in front of people when I'm training them on the ADA and tell them like, sometimes my civil rights are a burden. And in that case, you don't have to respect them is kind of a bummer. Mm -hmm. Um, And the, the ADA doesn't cover everything, particularly because it has that escape hatch, but also because there are a lot of ways of not welcoming someone that go beyond legal obligation um Mm -hmm. and so when we talk about like accessibility and accommodation the thing that I like to add at the end is radical welcome um Mm -hmm. because even if someone can get into your space what makes them want to and thank you listen Emily thank you for saying beyond legal obligation because that would actually an odd title and odd code public (laughs) that you Nice. About how you had to advocate for your super ID like, like with disability, then you can't just say, well, this is a disability issue, you know, go talk to HR, go talk to whoever at your institution does accommodation. You had to actually advocate for them and advocate against ableism in your workplace. Mm-hmm. Like a colleague making an able comment during a training instruction meeting or during another meeting, you had to speak up and you had to build that culture of anti ableism in your workplace for it to be truly welcoming for training with disability. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember a prior job I had where, you know, I was I was knitting in a meeting as I always do. Um and my supervisor called me aside and chewed me out for being disrespectful for knitting in the meeting. And I was like, okay, look, I know I'm here as a temporary contractor, like the ADA doesn't, ADA employment protections don't apply to me in this case. Um, But since you're an organization that's interested in serving people with disabilities, can we talk about how this is a reasonable accommodation um, and how I pay attention better when I am when I have something to do with my hands. She was like, but you have to understand, you have to be accommodating of other people too. And just like, sure, I guess, if there was someone's disability that was being set off by, I don't know, wool allergies, we could have a civilized conversation about it. Um, But no, I don't have to accommodate your dislike of what I do to get to baseline um functioning level that you expect from me in the workplace um and that's not and it wasn't a legal issue like it wasn't about being denied legal protections I was entitled to it was about someone deciding that I didn't fit in Mm -hmm. like I didn't look the way their employees were supposed to look um and that and that's not about the law it's about human decency, which I think is the part where um, overly legalistic uh, interpretations fail. Um, And that was a medical organization. So when we talk about like people with disabilities coming into a medical setting, um, like a clinical setting and 
trying to see what kind of care they were getting like that's not really encouraging um and i was the one person hired there to like make culture change to make the organization less ableist and i couldn't even get myself to be able to knit in meetings um so it's not really shocking when you have um studies coming out like um, oh God, it was in health reports a couple months ago, Lisa Iazoni's study about uh, bias in Iazoni is I-E-Z-Z-O-N-I. Um, her study about bias uh, in physicians where 80% of physicians said that they didn't think people with disabilities could have the same quality of life as non-disabled mm -hmm. people. Like if that's the field you're going into expecting to be taken care of um a lot of work needs to be done before you're going to feel welcome there even if there are ramps at every staircase mm -hmm. um because that attitude doesn't go away just because the law says it should and also i know i've had additionally i know i had a lot of calling um, and who work in healthcare setting to go to work and they're using like the staff how you go there acting, you know, did my fourth day, I'm the new neuropsychologist. Um, could you put in the outfit? They get told, oh, these are for staff. They're <laughs> and they're like, yes, I am staff, you hire me. Like, and it, a big issue. I've seen with my colleagues and it really fluctuating because it just showed how both viewed because of our disability as being automatically that's legitimate. Mm -hmm. At professional, but I would argue in many cases our disability makes that more legitimate. Particularly, yeah, if we're using our intimate knowledge of what disability feels like and having a disabled body or mind feels like to inform our work like we have expertise that you just can't get um academically not that academic expertise is invalid but there are they're parallel forms of legitimacy and mm -hmm. if you have both of those forms of legitimacy yeah people ought to be listening to you in the workplace mm -hmm. um the my predecessor in my current job um is who's probably watching this um is blind and um uses a service dog and like is very loud about the fact that she is blind and also has a master's in public health um and was coordinating the health and disability program before me and she was at a software training and was like this software isn't accessible to me um and she was told oh well it's not public facing it's for professionals only so we didn't have to make it accessible she's like i'm not a volunteer here like i am getting paid to be here and and yeah like i think it comes back around to what we were saying at the very beginning of this discussion the idea that you can either be a member of the community or you can be a real professional but never the twain shall meet mm -hmm. um and i don't know if there's a remedy for that other than just numbers and like taking over um mm -hmm. I think getting people um, who might not resonate with the term disability, but to whom it could apply, more comfortable identifying with the community can also help. Because, like, I bet we have more disabled people uh, in the Department of Public Health than we know about. Um, but why would you out yourself like that if there's not going to be anything good coming out of it at the end? So it's, I don't know, I feel like I'm talking in circles because we need more visibility to get um, a better professional environment, but we need a better field in order for people to feel safe being visible. And I don't actually know where the start of that circular process is. This memory, yeah, I agree that a major issue, and I know when we done studying and we act, um, disabled psychology, what advice we give to training with similar disability. It was really interesting because the individual with visible disability tend to say, you know, this girl, get the conversation out there, take control because they're going to make, be making assumptions about you and you want to actually counter them, they can't legally ask the question. 
But the individual with invisible disability doctor said, you know, this do everything you can to hide it until you're not only hired, but you had to offer an inquiry and it's going to be a real pain for them to fire you because there are stories that people will be cut in accommodation and then all of a sudden their interview just disappeared or their job offer just disappeared. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been interesting for me going from invisibly disabled to very visibly disabled over the past several years. Um, Like my resume is extremely visibly disabled. Like at this point, if you look at my resume, there is no doubt who and what I am. But if I show up for an interview, if I showed up for an interview 10 years ago, um, as I did um, when I was working in independent living, I had to disclose. Um, it's It was a very backward sort of situation because in the independent living field, it's a bonus um, if you are disabled and applying for a job. Um, so I had to be like very clear in my cover letter and in my interview, like as a person with a disability, you know, I woke up this morning and just working it in everywhere because I didn't feel legitimate in my disabled self. Um, But at the same time, outside of that environment, yeah, no, I wouldn't talk about it unless it was absolutely necessary. Um, But now it's switched. Like I go out in either using a cane or a power chair and people know at least some of my disability is right, uh, right when they look at me. And then it's about, yeah, it's about expectation management. Um, Here is how to deal with me as a disabled person, here are the things you can and cannot expect when interacting with me. Um, here are the things I need. Here are the advantages that hiring me will give you. Um, and in some way, it's also similar to how I feel about being, you know, a light skinned person of color and a femme queer. Like, um, in some spaces, people know who I am, whether or not I want them to. Um, like after 9-11, the way I found out about it was my family getting death threats um, because we're Arab American. Um, so clearly I wasn't white in that moment. Um, but when I walk into a space, like I have to announce, oh yes, I am Arab American or make an affirmative decision not to announce it. Um, and the same like, with queerness like I take on very obvious symbols of visible queer femininity the cat's eye glasses for example like um because I'm either too visible or invisible at any given moment and I like to be in charge of um which of those things I am um and I think that is a luxury of being invisibly disabled but it is a luxury that comes with a huge cost in Mm -hmm. uncertainty and tension um when i was more invisible i had to do a lot more thinking about how i was perceived in every possible situation and planning for it in advance and worrying about whether my disguise would be seen through um in a way that just referring to it as you know, invisible and, um, or closeted or passing, like as all of those terms leave out the fact that it is, it still requires a lot of identity management. And I think it can be liberating, like for people who don't necessarily think of themselves as disabled enough to be worth disclosing their disability in the workplace, um, to get it over with. Um, and I also know someone call me with disability that he had to disclose because they weren't visible, weren't ready to parent. They struggled a lot in tonight people with them. Oh, I'm not disabled enough to get accommodations. Yeah. Um, I actually had to put on the invitation for the disability affinity group and we'll see how it works. Um Here is a very broad definition of disability. If any of this resonates with you at all, whether or not you've requested accommodations or um, or use the term disability to describe yourself, you are welcome. Um, Because what I originally wanted to put was if you're asking if you're disabled enough, the answer is automatically yes. Um, And that was deemed insufficiently formal for the uh, announcement. But it really is like, 
non-disabled people don't spend this much time worrying about whether or not they count as disabled. Yeah, but similar to something I heard about being trans, that you're bundling your trans, you're probably not a cis. Yeah, I will own up to, to that one as well. <laughs> Um, that is honestly how a lot of my like identity revelations have gone. Like, I'm thinking about this too much for the answer to be no. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's something that people think. And I think this is, again, something that the law and the health community interpreted broadly um, kind of has to answer for. Like, we have defined disability as a category to keep yourself out of at all cost. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're in it, it's because you are, you know, truly deserving. Um, and by deserving, I mean needy. Um, and so there's no perceived, um, sorry, scratch that backing up. Um, when people realize that they are not as far away from the border of disability as they thought they were um, and are kind of like clawing to maintain that legitimacy in the outside world that being a non-disabled person gives you, um, on the other side is, well, I don't deserve all of the nice things that I think disabled people get. <laughs> um, so it's a bad thing to be, but a a uh, thing that supposedly confers a lot of benefit to you on the other side. And it's really easy to internalize all of that um, mm -hmm. and think that you are just bad at being an abled person and not a perfectly adequate disabled person. Um, and, and yeah, when we define disability as the failure state of mm -hmm. Um, of a medical intervention, for example, we contribute to that directly. This memory, yeah, and that as someone with a continual disability, mm -hmm. to you get so much of that messed in your kid, like your quality of life is based on whether or not you can walk and whether or not you can walk independently. Mm -hmm. And it basically, your success is defined by how how undisabled you can be, and that is kind of ingrained into you from a young age. Mm -hmm. And it's so, it can be so destructive, because like, well, because sometimes you see people doing things that would generally hurt their body because they want to reach that bar being quote unquote best disabled. Mm -hmm. And when you have physical therapists saying like no pain, no gain, um, it's it's really easy to learn to ignore any signals that your body is telling you and just shut off all of that body wisdom um, because you're taught that your pain doesn't matter. Um, I know someone who, uh, you know, had been in PT all her life and had second and third degree burns on her lap and didn't do anything about it for like an hour or so because it was just another type of pain that she thought she should be able to like push through. Um, and that's so destructive, not only to people's bodies, um, but to their souls and their relationship with themselves. Um, and what is the best case scenario of that? Like, okay, you get somewhere on foot instead of in a chair. Like, how how big of benefit is that for the costs that we're expecting people to bear? Um, like, nobody can walk forever on foot. At some point, you're going to have to take a wheeled vehicle. What does it matter if you take it from the beginning of the journey rather than, like, down the block getting into your car? Um, that's, that's not enough to teach people to destroy themselves for. Mm -hmm. This memory, yeah, and I knew, uh, 
And then a portion of CP going up, you would fall down all the time, which can is really dangerous. Mm -hmm. But it appeared when whenever people would bring up, hey, like would he benefit from some type of mobility aid, they would be like, oh no, no, no. Like he not disabled like she is, meaning me. Um, oh, no. He doesn't need no thing. And like, well, maybe he does and that okay. Or like maybe he can do without them, but would do better with them. Like now as a part-time wheelchair user, there are absolutely times when I don't use it, like walking around the house. Um, and in theory, I could walk more than I do. And I am sure my doctor wants me to. Um, but just because I can do it doesn't mean it's worth the energy to do it or the fall risk or the amount of time that I spend dizzy. Um, like there's, there's actually nothing wrong with doing things that are easier, um, especially if they give you more energy to do the harder things. Like the thing that decided me that I needed to start using a wheelchair more regularly is I went to um, the APHA conference, the American Public Health Association for the first time. And it's held in this like huge conference hall. And I knew the hotel that I got was going to be really far away from the conference center. Um, so I bit the bullet and rented a wheelchair. Um, and I had not had that amount of energy since high school. Um, and I was, I was used to conference crash. Like I knew, in my heart that if I went to a conference, I would be out of commission for the week afterwards. Like that in my head and heart was what a conference was. And then when I got to a conference where I didn't have to use all of that energy just to walk around, I could use that energy to listen to people's talks and like make connections and be a person and like still do all of the things the next week that I wanted to. And I realized even if I, could in theory function on some level without it it's not worth denying myself the comfort and the ease and the ability to do other things um and just because my brain relates everything back to like either public health or healthcare, the idea of like medical necessity criteria um, or the Medicare homebound rule, which drives me up the wall where you can't get a piece of durable medical equipment if you intend to use it outside the house because it means that you're not homebound enough to benefit from it. Like that's why we have so many power wheelchairs that don't function in the rain um because they're not meant to be used outside and if they are used outside it's like sneaky off-label use um but like people with disabilities have stuff to do mm -hmm. and like even if you do stay in your home all or most of the time that's not the one and only way to be disabled and if you have medical equipment like that might increase your ability uh to get out and function or not and that's okay too um, I don't have an, I see Lydia's coming back on camera, which probably means we're wrapping up soon. And I don't have anything like pithy to say, um, to close us out. So I'm hoping they do. This is Lydia. I've been really enjoying this conversation and I'm so glad that I was able to be a little bit of a part of it with you. <laughs> I know that public health has just been top of mind for everybody for the last year for really obvious reasons, right? Like there's a whole global pandemic. And the first time anyone knows what epidemiologists do for a living. Right. <laughs> and here we are um, dealing with on the one hand, the public health field largely not taking into account the lived experience mm -hmm. and expertise of disabled people. And many people who do disability advocacy knowing deeply from personal experience where inequities lie in our health systems, but not necessarily having the ability to navigate or participate in public health spaces. And that's why I think the work that both of you do is so vital and important. And I hope will also lead us to more disabled people being in leadership positions in research and in policy 
doing public health work. I now know that we have a lot of people here who are really eager to engage with you directly. And I'm going to close this out so that we can transition to a period of live Q&A with our participants. So if you left a question in the chat, we've received it and we're going to transition to conversation with you now. Thank you so much. This is Lydia. I'd like to invite Nasra and Emily back. Yay, it worked. We have a few questions that have come in since the beginning of our time together. The first one is from Mary, who asks us, would either of you be willing to share a perspective or opinion on access to assistive devices? For example, wheelchairs, AC devices, or other such things within the United States. It seems like insurance companies are driving a lot of the pricing structure for these devices. So many people are blocked from getting the devices that would bring them a lot of autonomy and independence just because of cost alone. So this is Nasra. Um, yes, I would say your your summary of the issue is accurate. <laughs> um, and I was I was laughing at the end of the video because um, we did start to get into how insurance uh, companies restrict access to DME, and I I was hoping you were listening to that part as it was happening. Um, yeah, I mean the the best initiatives that I've seen for. Um, access to assistive devices have been um, recycling programs. That's actually how I got my chair. Um, it's like a, if I had to pay for it out of pocket and I would because I was going to use it outside the house, um, it would have been something like $70,000. Um, but someone who outgrew it um, donated it to a program we have in the state that refurbishes old um, assistive equipment and gives it back out for free. Um, and that grew out of a mutual aid program that had been operating really successfully in the community before the state even got involved. Um, and the state just kind of lent the coordinating infrastructure to it. Um, do I think that's the best way for people to have to get DME? No. Um, do I think it's a really creative way to uh, avoid some of the barriers that, frankly, capitalism has imposed on the process? Um, yeah, and it's, it is an example of how disabled people are really good at solving problems. Um, and the, the solution to the problem usually involves relying on each other. That may really be extremely that way point, Nashua. Uh, to add to that, I'm someone who uses a walker, and I use what called a Bose or posture walker. Mm. And it's always been complicated getting someone to pay for that because all the Bose walkers are technically pediatric. Yeah. So, which always confused me because they're like, do they think we turn 18 and just eat a wound the ability to walk entirely or gain the ability to walk independently. Probably. Uh, so I know I'm fortunate in that I my family has had the financial resources to be able to find out a pocket and then my dad the mechanical engineer so he can repair them I know on his own. Um, but in this year I had is the company that made my walkers had stopped making it. So I have like my current walker and one or two backups. And then I'm I'm been thinking because kind of, I don't know what I'm going to do when I run out of walker. Yeah. Because so much of how I won't navigate my environment had been with the structure of the walker. 
And so I created a very significant barrier to DME. Um, and particularly, I know it comes up a lot with children with disabilities mm -hmm. because insurance will only pay for wheelchairs something like every three or five years. And we all know um, children tend to grow up fat than that. So <laughs> it creates an obvious budget for barrier, but something insurance companies don't care about and don't want to acknowledge. So definitely an issue. I mean, and even for adults, like wheelchairs break mm -hmm. faster than that. Exactly. And I'd always had a backup walker because I try to tell people when I walk a bridge, I can't do anything. Mm -hmm. I really need it to move. It's not like, a, oh, this is inconvenient or they are inconvenient. Like, I really cannot do anything. So I really need to have a backup walker. Yeah. Is there more questions? Lydia, I'm not hearing you. It doesn't look like good me. Oh, but... wait. Well, certainly not now because you're typing. No. No. No, I can't hear you. Either. As long as we're hanging out here, uh, your comment about backup walkers um, reminded me of when I got my first pair of backup glasses um, because I somehow lost my glasses on a plane, um, like in a completely sealed environment at 30,000 feet, I managed to lose my glasses. Um, and I was just completely non-functional more from anxiety than not from being able to see to be perfectly honest um but yeah so i got a backup pair of glasses and then i realized wait i can get multiple pairs of glasses that look different and like my assistive technology can be fashionable and pretty um and long story short, now I have like 20 pairs of glasses and like nine different canes and different colors. And I'm mostly just really annoyed that I cannot store, not to mention pay for, like, let's be clear, but like, I cannot have 20 different power chairs in all different colors. Um, and it's just extremely upsetting. <laughs> but yeah, I, I feel like that is not going to be, um, an issue that I would ever convince an insurance company of, even if I got them to to pay for one wheelchair. I had to see my mom would really appreciate the backup glasses thing because um, she wear glasses well and she really big on having a mom with the backup glasses. So one time when I was at home uh, from college on a break, and she saw I only had one pair of glasses. She was like in total panic mode, the entire eight hour drive at the car. She's like, she like, what are you going to do? You only want to go to the need to go to the garage and strong get you back in there now. We need to make sure you get on time so you can go. Like, down. I have not lost my glasses yet. We do not need to make an emergency lens crafters run. It's going to be fine. And then right. it's funny, we got there and we found out I had back of glass anyway, so it was an entire panic for nothing. But Great. When you made that comment, I was thinking, boy, you and Holden really get along. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was really sad, too, because the airline uh, offered me my choice of glasses that had been left behind and lost and found by other people. Um, so it was like digging through this basket of other people's glasses, trying to find one that was like a prescription, even remotely close to mine. And all that did was give me a migraine. Um, 
So yes, I never out of my control again. Yeah, um, I wonder how they shot out in the wall. Can do the I, I think they just saw like hysterically crying customer and decided they had to do something, um, which is fair. Like I would do a lot to, um, if someone like me showed up sobbing on my doorstep, I would do a lot to like mm-hmm. get them to calm down too. Um, I am going to take Not the initiative. This is Lydia. Oh, yay. Can good. Hear me? Yes. Uh, we can hear Apparently, you. Apparently, where I'm staying this week, nobody can ever hear me on Zoom, and I keep having to sign in from my phone. I had oh, to give delightful. a little keynote address this way earlier this week. Um, actually, I think that was yesterday. Um, well, we have another... Back. We have another question from Natalia, N-A-T-A-L-I-J-A, who asks a little bit off topic, but since you mentioned the vaccination, how do you feel about mandating vaccination for college students? A lot of universities are requiring a vaccine, but does that perhaps violate some public institution policies? Um, I don't think I'm in a role now where it's appropriate for me to have public opinions on that. Um, The joy of working for the government. Um, I will say that in terms of uh, policy considerations and whether it violates policies, there is definitely um, precedent for mandatory vaccinations. Um, There are a lot of vaccines you already have to get to go to college. and just from a, like a strictly pattern matching um, perspective, this does not seem very different to me. This is Emily. I would agree with that. Um, I went to grad school in a state that required the military that mean uh, because it was a state where they were unfortunately hit with a repeated deadly military outbreak among college students. So to me, men with that mean for you what in college it all like Kanasha said really nothing new. And I think there's a lot of precedent for them in the field. This is Lydia. We have another question here from Mary, who says, Nasra, your story about the disappointment you experienced when the mass disability community pushed back on that first policy draft made me think about advocacy fatigue. For both of you, how do you reinvigorate your energy, articulation, and optimism to keep showing up and keep pushing for improvements? Even if it's practical things, I would appreciate learning how you take care of yourselves when so much of your lives are at I think it, listen, Emily, I think it really helped for me when I did get positive messages or positive reinforcement. People were telling me that my work had an impact. For example, generally I got a really unexpected note out in a brief of professional acquaintance saying, hey, I saw some of the stuff you with on your experience at Able with them that made me realize I haven't ever considered able with them. I haven't done anything to address it myself and in my environment and walk around it. So you inspired me to do a lot of reading and to go forward and really incorporate the high act. And it's super nice to get those little reinforcing reminders that, hey, what I'm doing does have an impact. It's something that really does feel like you'll um, kind of just hitting a brick wall repeatedly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I will say, so there are actually a couple things I wanted to say. Oh, no. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties here. Um, completely with my own making. No, stop. Okay, sorry. Um, for some reason, my phone decided to play the live stream of this, um, and I was hearing it from multiple directions. Um, Yeah, so I will first say that I'm not a good role model in that respect in terms of like self-care. 
I'm probably closer to a cautionary tale. <laughs> um, the the other thing I will say is that uh, I just to be like super crystal clear um, is that I wasn't disappointed that the disability community pushed back on the policy. Um, I was super proud of them. Uh, I was disappointed that we came out with a policy that needed pushback. Um, that said, I mean, I do attempt to keep some sort of social connections alive. Um, like during the pandemic, I have been in a Monday night knitting group, a one Tuesday a month uh, tarot workshop, a Wednesday night knitting group, um, a Thursday night book group, and then Friday night uh, Star Trek watching with my partner. So like, I, and like, I've missed a lot of those. Um, here and there just out of exhaustion, but as an extrovert um, in the worst year for extroverts possibly on record, um, I've, I've had to get that social connection and get that energy from other people in other ways. Um, also, as Emily said, like the recognition helps. Um, I'm really bad at taking a compliment, um, but I like, once I have allowed it to get into my brain, I will tuck it away in my heart forever. Um, and it it does sometimes when you feel like you're yelling into the void and like doing all of this stuff for no reason, um, just to have someone say like, oh, you changed my perspective on this or, um, you know, I'm glad you're doing this work because it makes it easier for me to do, you know, other work uh, and make sure that I'm reaching the right people. Like that, that positive feedback, even if it's just a sentence, um, is really helpful. And lately, it also helps to counter the negative feedback that like the public health profession has been getting a lot of, um, not necessarily undeservedly, but it's still kind of traumatic sometimes. <laughs> And I will say this should sound very ridiculous, I admit, but I, within that month or so, bought the video in Animal Crossing. Nice. Um, and I found it really helpful when told them sitting down here to walk. And they're like, oh, at 9 p.m. I had to sell all my stuff the day before this uh, stolen game closed at 10. So it kind of forced me to like step up my computer, take a break, and... Not to walk all night, because the walk will never be done. I think yeah. that kind of the draining thing about advocacy sometimes is our walk is never really going to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess knitting is sort of my animal crossing, um, though with fewer deadlines, which makes it um, less effective at pulling me away from things. I used to actually do competitive knitting where there were deadlines. Um, and you had to make like a certain number of uh, projects a month. And that really kept me focused. Um, I should probably go back to that at some point because I need more deadlines in my life, obviously. This is Lydia. We have a question from Caroline who says, what is required to get more disabled leadership into public health policy? It's clearly needed. Have there been instances or moments that were key or stand out in your journeys? Hmm. Uh, from an academic perspective, because that what I do. In terms of getting uh, more disabled people involved in public health, I think it would be really helpful to have more disabled faculty in public health programs and related programs. Because oftentimes, as a disabled student, um, there are you don't see any disabled faculty. You don't know any disabled faculty, and disability is always spoken at the other, like oh, them, not us, and it really irritating, really exhausting. So, and I know one of the best things we in grad school was actually meeting. Um, other disabled psychologists and meeting other disabled people in the field, so I felt less isolated mm -hmm. and I felt more like it was me and my community. 
and not to me, mostly everyone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Um, and I think, yeah, that, that sort of starts the pipeline too, because if you have people studying public health and seeing like public health grownups that look like them, um, they're more likely to stay in the field. Um, I think from the perspective of like uh, outside academia, public health, um, like it's hard to think about recruiting people into the profession when you don't know how the profession is going to treat them. Um, so you, you have to know that like there are that there are people who are both able to frankly put up with abuse sometimes and also people who have your back who will protect you from that. Um, one sort of hero of mine, and he'd probably be appalled to hear me describe him that way. Um, there, so my, my first day working um, in Massachusetts in the Independent Living Center, um, I got sent to a meeting to take notes from my boss because he couldn't make it. Um, and it happened to be a meeting related to some new healthcare reform that was happening in Massachusetts. And out of that meeting came um, a group called uh, DAAHR, DAR, uh, Disability Advocates Advancing Our Healthcare Rights. Um, and that hour is very intentional there. Um, and so one of the uh, co-chairs who was at that first meeting, Dennis Heafy, uh, it's H-E-A-P-H-Y, um, is a wheelchair user, um, has been for decades and decades, um, who also has a master's in public health. Um, and I think like a couple of other masters just for fun. Um, and has been a public health policy expert forever. Um, and is really like that previous generation of public health person with a disability who has seen um, He's seen some shit um, and he has uh, been part of changing a lot of it. And like, I refer to him as the prior generation, but he, like, he's still going, like he hasn't stopped yet. Um, and I try, and then like, there's Lisa Iazoni who wrote that article about um, physician bias. She is an MD um, who, uses a scooter and who was told she would never be able to practice medicine uh, because of her disability. So she um, ended up researching medical bias instead, um, probably knowing that there was a lot of material there for her to find. Um, and I got a chance to meet her really early on because the Massachusetts health and disability community is um, really vibrant and really close knit. And so having people to look up to to tell me what pitfalls I'm about to fall into um, and describe how they got out of them um, in in their day, back in their day, um, has been a really amazing privilege. Um, and just, yeah, it's, I referred to it earlier as a, as a cyclical process, improving the environment by hiring more people with disabilities, um, but also hiring more people with disabilities, um, even though the environment needs improving. Like, it's, it's hard to know where to start, and I think it starts with people um, willing to take some emotionally unhealthy risks to make things better for the people who are coming after them. Um, and I'm really grateful to the people who took those risks for me. Um, and yeah, like I'll, I'll talk to any students who email me ever um, and attempt not to scare them away. <laughs> um, and I, I feel like that's paying it forward for me. Shame, I agree. I'm really appreciative of the uh, disabled people in my field and the way the field can come for me. I really try to pay that forward in terms of working with disabled training and mentoring disabled training and just constantly reminding uh, psychology, hey, we're not doing well enough in it. We need to do better at including and keeping disabled people. Um, 
because what we found in psychology is disabled grads who are not equally academic qualified when they enter the program, but they still drop out at high rates. Probably because of the incredible amount of anger within they face going through the program. And it's easy for pe people, particularly able bodied people, I think, to sweep that under the rug and go, hmm, not a problem here, don't need to think about that. It's it's like the um, old joke of the shopkeeper who won't put in a ramp because they never see any wheelchair users in their shop. Um, it's like, yeah, there aren't a lot of disabled people to hire because you've chased them out of the profession before they finish school. Mm -hmm. um, or you hire them and make them hide their disability or mm -hmm. not want to be here. Mm -hmm. This is Lydia. We have a question from Jennifer. And I think this will be our second to last question because we also have one from Katrina, which should be, I guess it's kind of related. Jennifer asks us, what can panelists say about helping colleagues understand what might be needed to create a supportive workplace for invisible disabilities like depression? And this goes beyond claiming a disability accommodation and more towards normalizing diverse abilities. Then Katrina asks, and I feel like this is a related question. Do you know of any international disability organizations? It'd be good to learn from and support each other. And those will be our last. This is, in my regard to the fourth question, one thing we, how people, uh, particularly supervisors, is in order to create a disability formative environment, you need to actively counter able with them when you see it in your colleagues. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they make an able statement during a meeting or when you're certain candidate, you need to be willing to call it out. Um, because if you don't, um, that institutional able them to go down check and people end up feeling like they can't dispel, they can't identify, they can't ask for accommodation. Mm -hmm. So I think a really big part of that is just creating the culture that not only, you know, does what they're all required, but actively is disability formative. Yeah, um, and being really broad when you think about what ableism can look like in the workplace. Um, so it's not just like, oh, did you see that completely incompetent disabled person? Like, haha, -ha, they're incompetent. Um, but things like, oof, you know, I give that assignment to so and so, but she's been a little flaky lately. Um, and I find that sometimes, and like, she's been a little flaky lately can mean a lot of things. Like she hasn't been doing the work. Well, okay. Um, but I feel like sometimes the most interesting question you can ask is like, why or how so? Um, so if someone says, well, all oh, this work has to be done in the office. Oh, really? Why? Well, because you have to talk to other people and, and you can only do that in person. Oh, really? Why? Um, and like, just get in touch with your inner three-year-old there, um, because at a certain point, the only answer people have for some of these things is because that's what I'm used to and that's what we've always done. And what we're used to is ableism. Like, we have a lot of experience doing ableism. We're really good at ableism. We have developed those skills over time. Um, but that's not a good enough reason to, to keep doing it. Um, and so, yeah, like sometimes, I don't know, maybe this is just a, a thing that fits with my personality and other people should take it and adapt it. But I feel like sometimes just being really innocent in a slightly obnoxious but plausibly deniable way um, can make, can open up a lot of space um, for those conversations. Um, and I do think like if you have a, a, an invisible disability and you feel secure enough in doing so, being open about it can also make space for other people. Um, and then 
if there's so diversity training can only go so far in the workplace but even the idea of getting some disability content into diversity training even if it's kind of bad disability content fixes in people's minds that like disability is a category in a, is a demographic category that can increase the diversity of the workplace um and that that perspective can start changing attitudes even if the content itself is mediocre and then international disability organizations i am so bad i have been so stuck in my massachusetts bubble for so long um like I know the World Federation of the Deaf is fantastic um, because I, I have in fact been to a couple of their conferences, um, but other international organizations. This might be a, an Emily or Lydia question completely. This is Lydia. There are so many international focused disability organizations that it really just depends on if you're looking to support people doing work in a specific region or doing work on a particular topic. Uh, and is that work based out of or connected to people doing work in the United States where we currently are or work that's being done entirely outside the United States altogether. I uh, could try to give a very long list. I would probably not be very successful in doing that. I can name a couple of organizations that I know that are doing really interesting work in a few different places. Uh, for example, organizations based out of the United States include Women Enabled International, which does work across the globe, but has offices here in the US. Uh, organizations outside the US include the Sisters of Freedom in the United Kingdom, which is the Disabled Women's Organization, Anna Insan, A-N-A-I-N-S-A-N, -A -A which is I Am a Human Society. Um, the other thing I would put in a plug for um, is uh, Twitter, honestly. Like disability Twitter is a pretty good place to find folks um, that is not geographically uh, separated. And I know, like, I, I believe the person who was asking the question um, was Irish, did I get that right? Um, and I, there are definitely um, Irish people in disability Twitter. So um, we heard most of your answer, Lydia. I think you maybe cut off at the end, I don't know. The last organization I heard you mention was Anna Insan. Anna Insan is based in Jordan. It's uh, the I Am a Human Society for the Rights of Disabled People. Um, there is the organization CREA Institute, C-R-E-A Institute, which is not disability specific. They are based in India and they lead a, a, an institute every year on disability, sexuality, and reproductive justice that is really awesome. Uh, there's the organization BizHut, B-I-Z-C-H-U-T, which is based in Israel and does work both in Israel and in occupied Palestinian territory on disability rights. Uh, I worked a long time ago a little bit with the organization Tabu, T-A-B-U, which is based in Iceland, which is pretty awesome as well. Um, there is, uh, there are many other organizations that different organizers uh, are leading in different spheres, policy, research, Kaylee, who is one of AWN staff, uh, so has worked uh, with disabled activists outside the US in Southeast Asia as well, and should feel free to drop some names in the chat. Um, in any case, we are at the close of our time together. So I thank all of you for sticking through with us, especially through our technical difficulties today, and hope to see you at our next programs in May, which we will announce shortly. Thank you so much.